Uh, welcome back to the channel. My name is Abby and you are watching The Great Discworld Project 2021 where I will be reading and reviewing all the Discworld novels by the end of the century at this rate. So... <laughs> Uh, this is part three, so I will be, of course, reviewing Equal Rights, uh, where I'll be giving uh, my thoughts, feelings, opinions on the book. But first, very quickly, where the bloody hell have I been? Uh, uh, here, mainly. <laughs> I mean, normally in a different room, but uh, yeah. I <laughs> you know how there's a thing? going on in the world that has made lots of things very bad and it's been going on for over a year uh well yeah that thing and i uh, sad and bad and makes me feel sad and bad and i've been very sad uh too sad to feel like filming myself i could go into a half an hour diatribe about exactly what's going on with me however a that'd be really boring for you and b really personal for me and uh, I don't want to sit and listen to someone's plethora of diagnoses. I don't expect you to want that either, especially not in a video about fun books about witches and wizards and staffs with personalities. Uh, so let's just say here I am. I also apologize that I am barefaced and in my PJs. But I either had the energy to put on makeup and get into all my gothic finery or film a video. So here we are. Because I feel awful that it's been like two months at this point, more than that. I don't even know. Uh, so I just want to get this film, get it out, get back on the horse. Uh, Mort is next. I'm very excited to do that video. But we need to get this one out of the way first. I get this out of the way, like it's just, it's... Uh, as with my previous two videos, I will leave a timestamp in the description down below so that you can skip the summary if you are aware of what happens in the book or, you know, you just don't want to listen to me prattle on about that bit. Um, if you haven't read the book in a while or whatever, here's the summary for you now. I've also slightly changed up my filming setup so my phone is now no longer balanced on my laptop. Uh, so my notes for the summary are here, so I apologise that I'll be looking down <laughs> to read that. Also look, look at all my lovely stickers. Uh, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, are uh, all from Mr Lucian. I will put a link to his shop down in the description because I think he's awesome. And this one, and this one, and this one and this one and this one and this one are from bones and blankets and i will leave a link to their shop in the description as well this is from a record shop in hull i don't know that they have a website and these stickers are from boxes of hello panda my favorite japanese treat because watashiwa bakugaijin weeaboo des etc uh so <laughs> let's get on with the summary an elderly wizard, soon to die, travels to the distant and secluded mountain town of Bad Ass to bestow his staff and, by extension, his wizardry onto the eighth son of an eighth son. The baby is in the process of being born, and before anyone will listen to Mistress Weatherwax protest that this son is actually a daughter, the staff is passed on to the baby girl, Escarina Smith, which cannot be undone. Despite the best efforts of Weatherwax and the child's father, Esk clearly has access to a lot of very strong powers that need to be trained and controlled. Granny takes Esk in as an apprentice to witch witchcraft and Esk takes to it well but is drawn to the much more powerful showy magic of wizards. After a near fatal borrowing incident, I'll explain, it becomes clear to Granny that Esk should follow her desire to become a wizard and the two travel to Ankmore Court to the Unseen University, getting separated and then reunited along the way. As wizards are all fuddy-duddy men with big stupid beards, the idea of a girl wizard is too much for them, but Granny finds her employment in the university as a servant. Esk uses this time to try and learn as much as she can, whilst her staff, disguised as a broom, does all the work for her. Esk follows the progress of Simon, a new student to the university, who pushes new and interesting ideas about how the universe and magic work. However, poor Simon ends up opening a portal to the dungeon dimension. Ooh. The staff hits Simon on the head, closing the portal but trapping Simon's mind there. Believing the staff attacked Simon, Esk throws it away. 
Esk attempts to rescue Simon and ends up in the dungeon dimension herself, where she discovers that the only way to defeat the creatures that live there is if you can use magic, but don't. With the help of Weatherwax and Q-Tangle, the arch chancellor of the university, Simon and Esk use the staff to return home where they pioneer a new type of magic, positing the greatest power of all is not using the powers you have. So, equal rights. First of all, I want to say that equal rights is, of the first three, the most Discworldy. Right off the bat, the narrative voice is so much more refined. As I mentioned, I believe, in my um, Light Fantastic review, that there were a couple of moments that I laughed at. I had multiple moments that I laughed at in this, just the general feel of the tone of the narration. Um, Pratchett is pushing a lot more what you can do with words than he did in Colour of Magic or Light Fantastic, which is good to see. Uh, we also meet Granny Weatherwax, which is very exciting. Um, she's not quite right yet. However, um, as you'll remember, I'm sure, uh, people who've watched the old videos uh, will possibly remember how angry I was at the portrayal of death. I say angry, I was quite turned down, but death in The Colour of Magic is not death that we get from more onwards. Um, it's a completely different character, basically. Granny Weatherwax is not quite refined yet here, but she is much more recognisably Granny Weatherwax of later on in the books um, than, you know, death to death, basically. Which is good to see and it's fun to read, but yeah, she's just not quite right. And in a way that's sort of nebulous and difficult to pin down. Uh, you know, death, it was very easy to point out that like his attitude is wrong, he's just killing things for fun, that's not death. Um, but here it's just that Granny Weatherwax is not quite there yet. Just not quite. Um, but overall, I enjoyed Equal Rights more than I enjoyed Colour of Magic or Light Fantastic. It was a much easier read because of how much funnier the narration is. So it just sort of dragged me along a lot better than Colour of Magic Light Fantastic, which both didn't take very long to read either, but it was more a... Uh, those were quick to read because I wanted to get it out of the way. This was quick to read because I wanted to read it, which is, you know, a good sign <laughs> for a book. Um, but first things first, really, I mean, I say first things first, I've been wittering for, ooh, nine minutes for me. Hopefully I've cut that down a bit. Um, I love the pun of the title, Equal Rights. Rights like magic rights, ha 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 ha. Um, so, I know that I'm meant to be reviewing these books as, or talking about these books as standalones, as individual books, and I know I've been doing a terrible job of that so far. Um, but this is the book that we meet Escarina Smith in, and she is not in any other books until The Shepherd's Crown, which is the final Discworld, no Discworld novel that was published. Um, and I don't think it's fair for me to put spoilers for books other than the one I am specifically talking about. Um, so I shan't go too much into it, but in The Shepherd's Crown there is a boy who wants to be a witch, not a wizard, he specifically wants to be a witch. And the dichotomy of witches are women, wizards and men didn't sit right with me then it doesn't sit right with me ever uh because <laughs> you know gender is a spectrum folks i don't want to get too much into that but you know i'm not a girl not a robot all of those things so uh the idea that you know women can only be one thing or, you know, one thing can only be women, one thing can only be men, didn't sit right with me. But here in the first book where Pratchett is actually really introducing the concept, um, because in Colour of Magic Like Fantastic, it's sort of, sh it, it's shown that wizards are men, but it isn't essential to the plot. It's just sort of, all these wizards are men. Um, it's not brought up, it's not discussed, it's not the point. However, this one's called Equal Rights, what did I expect? Uh, but it is about that dichotomy and it is about everyone's opinions on that. 
Um, and it's great, you know. I also enjoy that the characterization of Escarina Smith is such that she'd probably want to be a wizard whether or not she got a staff. Um, because it's kind of heralded as this great mistake that um, Drummit, the drum billet, drum billet, uh, the wizard who's dying has given his staff to a girl. That's that's um, touted as you know like a horrible, terrible mistake. But who Escarina is really kind of meshes very well with what wizards do with magic versus what witches do with magic. And there's a lot in that dichotomy. Um, Weatherwax and Q-Tangle later on in the book have a big blowout magic fight, um, which is fun enough to read, but you know, like, uh, any kind of big bombastic, very visual fight in a novel is to my mind never going to be the most interesting part of a novel. Um, just describing things exploding just kind of like, cool, I'd like to see that in a film more than read about it personally. But it's not like a huge part of the book. It's not It's not a big complaint. Um, so, you, and you see there that the that witches and wizards have access to magic that's on a level, right? You know, they can both fire things out of their hands and like bring down the ceiling and like, you know, all sorts of big bombastic magic things, they can both do exactly the same things. However, in their day-to-day -day lives and their day-to-day -day magic practices, what witches do and what wizards do are different things. And we kind of have a dichotomy here of witches being, you know, sort of medical professionals almost. Um, you know, lots of uh, being midwife duties, sitting up with people who are dying, um, trimming the toenails of elderly men who can't trim their own toenails anymore. Lots of this kind of homely looking after the interests of individual people, whereas wizard magic is all about big questions about how the universe works and how all of this slots together and creating sigils and fancy spells and all of this stuff. Um, both of which are presented as not equal, I would say. Um, maybe this is just my personal bias, <laughs> I'm not sure, but, you know, give me a witch over a wizard any day. At least give me a Pratchett witch over a Pratchett wizard every, uh, any day. I'm not talking about real world practitioners of the black arts. Uh, you know, we, we're a different case. But in this fictional universe, you know, I'd much rather have a witch helping me than a wizard. Uh, but still, it's this dichotomy that I think is rooted in kind of historical gender roles of, yeah, once, you know, we had like medical professionals and universities to learn to be doctors and stuff, women weren't allowed to do that. That was men. But for centuries prior, women were always there for births. Women were, you know, looking at kind of witchcraft in the real world and its roots in you know herbal medicine all of this stuff um but then women were barred from the official study um because i don't know insert some horrible sexist reasons here i guess and i like to see i like seeing that reflected very clearly in this book without it kind of smacking you over the head with it it's it is my favourite kind of social commentary, which is you can ignore the social commentary and enjoy the book. Um, I am a fan of reading theory, reading essays, all of this stuff. I obviously look at me. Um, <laughs> can I? Yeah, I sort of paint myself like I may as well just write SJW across my forehead, right? But. Um, this is making a lot of comments, but they're making comments in a way that means that you can just enjoy the nice story. And there is story to enjoy. Now, in my summary, I actually missed out a large chunk 
of the book because uh, there's a big section of it that is esque traveling to the Unseen University and traveling to Ankh-Morpork. Pork. And it doesn't really have much of an effect on the plot. Uh, ooh, here comes the criticism, folks. The plot is Escarina wants to become a wizard. Escarina goes to the Unseen University. Simon opens the Dungeon Dimension. All of that stuff. However, where is it that Simon opens the Dungeon Dimension? Uh, boom, 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 boom. So, uh, for my <laughs> copy, um, page 212 of 283 is where Simon opens the Dungeon Dimension. So that's the, uh, this is all esque being baby being trained by a witch. Huge chunk of it is travelling to Ankh Morpork. And then this is where the actual plot happens. Which is not necessarily bad, just that it feels a bit rushed. Like I was, and I was very much enjoying the first kind of two thirds of this book more than I enjoyed the final third where the plot actually kicks in because we're just following this precocious little girl traveling through the disc world basically on her own using very discerning glares and smarts to get herself from place to place and get herself traveling along with a group of people on boats ends up getting in with uh, Simon and his master wizard and they're traveling to Ankh Morpork as well and all of that is just so much fun uh, so so much fun as an ex-precocious child myself it's uh, always fun to read about them I in my humble opinion and Esk is a great character and it bops back and forth between Esk and Granny Weatherwax when they're separated and I like spending time with both of those characters. Again, Granny Weatherwax isn't quite where, I, she's not quite there yet, um, but she's close enough that it is lovely to spend time with her. But yeah, once the actual plot kicks in with a dungeon dimension and everything, it's just kind of, I don't know, disappointing to me. Um, because it feels like the sort of thing that needed more build-up. I mean, they do mention it here and there, and, like, the creatures from the Dungeon Dimension sort of show up earlier on in the book. But you almost kind of forget about them as you're just enjoying this journey. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a hero's journey. It just is. It's one of the seven plots that exist. Because all books are one of the seven plots that exist. Is it seven? I finished my degree two years ago, so I've forgotten all of this. So the structure of this book is a little bit odd to me, because it feels like two contradictory books trying to mesh themselves together. There's one that's the super serious threat of the dungeon dimension, and then there's this other that is far more whimsical and... Um, I mean, I guess more important because the kind of fun, whimsical journeys of a child, girl child trying to go and be a wizard are far more, I don't know, weighted with meaning. And what the dungeon dimension and the creatures within it mean or say about anything is not something I could really glean. They felt like monsters for monsters sake to me i am on that one i am extremely interested to hear if i've just completely missed any sort of reading and if you've read a, something into that that i haven't picked up on please 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 let me know because i'm fully aware that i am not a literature genius um so that there, there could very well be something that i missed there but i didn't pick up on anything it was just sort of monsters for monsters sake and they solve it really quickly um i do love escarina just punching one of the monsters you know she's in this horrible dimension and everything's weird and wrong and she's just like what if i just hit it and then it falls to pieces 
<laughs> which is a great moment. I really, really enjoy that. Um, but yeah, overall, the kind of story is a bit unfocused in that regard. Um, but not in such a way that I think that makes this a bad book. Not at all. I'm not saying that equal rights is bad. Like, you know, Colour of Magic, Light Fantastic, equal rights is a good chunky step up from the Light Fantastic to me. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So let's get into some uh, more specific little bits that caught my attention as I was reading through. Yeah, so something I complained about a lot in The Colour of Magic was the complete lack of agency that, you know, uh, that Rincewind and Two Flower were just a ball of yarn being battered about by a giant cosmic cat. But Escarina here has an overabundance of agency. She is in charge of everything she does at every possible second. Of course, there are things where people go, no, you can't do that. Like, no, you can't become a wizard. You can't join the Unseen University. But as she and Granny Weatherwax get split up and Escarina's, like, I think about eight, ten at this point, she's not very old. It's just like, right, well, I'll go to Ankh Morpork then and just does. And as I say, through just being a precocious, discerning, little child with a sort of Paddington hard stare manages to get away there and it's fun to read because you know in reality if you heard a story about a 10-ish year old girl just traveling from one end of the country to the other completely under her own steam and like hitchhiking um you'd all be like oh my god you know like, that's terrifying but it's fiction and she has a magical staff that is protecting her the whole way so it's fun to read rather than like, oh no, what's going to happen to it? Because the tone is very clearly, she's going to be fine. She's going to be all right. You know, you're not reading it like, oh my God, this is about child abduction. It's not. It's not at all. And it's fun to see such a young character have such agency. Um, especially as in the real world, children don't have much agency. Because they're children. You know, I'm not arguing about whether or not children should be just allowed to go off and do their own thing but um it's fun to see that in a fictional context and exploring that in a fictional context that this child just manages to pull this off through wits determination and a magical staff which is nice uh speaking of the staff uh, it's basically the luggage 2.0 with a little sprinkling of Kring, uh, the talking sword. The staff doesn't talk, but it's, um, personality seems a little bit more towards Kring, or just because it's a staff, so it's more like a weapon, um, that it has that kind of Kringness to it for me. But I like the staff a lot. I like its characterization through, again, no dialogue, the same way with the luggage, it's through sort of body language and action that we see the character of the staff. And whilst I say it's the luggage 2.0, it is its own character. You know, it's not the same character as the, as the luggage. Um, for example, the staff sulks <laughs> more than the luggage. Uh, after Escarinus throws the staff out because she thinks it attacked Simon, uh, it just has a massive sulk, and then there's a cold snap, and the staff's just like, oh, all right, and sets out huge sheets of ice, and it floods the entirety of Ankh Pork, and it's horrible and miserable, um, because the staff's having a sulk, because it was thrown away, which I do enjoy a lot. Um, going back briefly, actually, to what I was saying about the structure of this book and the story of this book, I think it would have benefited from the Colour of Magic treatment, i.e. having parts, because it is very defined parts. There's, you know, introduction and Escarina studying witchcraft under Granny Weatherwax. Then there's the journey to Ankh Morpork in the Unseen University. Then there's the Escarina in the university, and then there's the dungeon dimension, which is like this being part. But uh, I think it would have benefited from 
not chapter breaks, but part breaks, especially because the passage of time isn't very well communicated in the book. And she's with Granny Weatherwax for, like, as an apprentice for years, I think, but it wasn't until way after the fact that it became obvious to me that this has been going on for years and years and not like a summer, um, which is what it sort of feels like. But again, that's a tiny nitpick. Nitpick? Who's Nick? That's a tiny nitpick. Um, it's not a make or break sitch for me at all. Um, speaking of the writing, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of really great stuff in here. Um, but one phrase that really caught me was um, when Escarina ends up in the dungeon dimension, we use the phrase that she's under moonless moonlight, which is obviously an oxymoron, but very evocative, very creepy in two words. It's like, well, it's moonlight, but there's no moon, so what's going on? And it's just off in a very succinct and economical way, which I really enjoy. You know, I'd like the extended Pratchett bit where he's whispering on about something. I love that. But I also love his ability to just boop. And now you've got a full picture with just two words. That's genius. Anyone can prattle on long enough until something funny comes along. Save your comments about these videos. And... <laughs> And, but it takes real genuine skill to be able to use, utilize so few words in such an evocative way. Um, speaking of Pratchett's disappearances into long lengthy opinions about stuff that isn't necessarily part of the story, um, let me just find the pen. Page. So page 259 for me in this edition. Um, well, Q Tangle and Granny are on the back of Granny's broomstick. She's picked up the broomstick. Stink? Uh, she's picked up the broomstick. For those of you who are familiar with the series, you will know that Granny Weatherwax's broom needs a kickstart and you need to run up and down with it because it's a bit naff. Um, so the two of them are on the broom and uh flying about three inches off the ground <laughs> and going quite slowly and uh yeah so i thought they went faster q tangle continued and to be frank higher what do you mean higher asked granny trying to compensate for the wizard's weight on the pillion as they turned back up rather like pillion passengers since the dawn of time he persisted in leaning the wrong way now, a pillion passenger, pillion was not a word that I had come across before, and I'm always excited to learn a new word. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of you watching this video going, yeah, pillion, it's the back of a motorbike or whatever, like, come on, you know. Oh, yeah, I, I just didn't know that. I didn't know that. I have been a pillion passenger many, many times, and yet I didn't know that word, and I'm excited to have it now. Love collecting new words, snuggling up with my vocabulary. I don't know how frequently I'll be able to use the phrase pillion passenger, but damn straight I will find an excuse at some point. Um, but also it's just that little break into Pratchett's own opinions of like pillion passengers since the dawn of time he leans the wrong way. And that's part of the charm of Pratchett's work for me overall is the little sprinklings of real world gripes in amongst the story um but not in a way that's distracting i don't think anyway i'm sure that there are some people who don't like it but i find it very fun and it sort of you know humanizes the narrative voice because whether or not it's whether or not we believe that the narrative voice is pratchett himself or a th individual character as the narrative voice we could talk about that for a very long time uh <sighs> death of the author boo, 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 boo. i don't like death of the author very much uh i'm not going to derail this into my opinions about literary theory though that's not important for now maybe one day but yeah whether whether we think it's the 
it's Pratchett himself or like the character of the narrator because the character in the, of the narration is very very strong something I've talked about before about Discworld um, it just humanizes the narrative voice a little bit give it letting the narrative voice have opinions in that way is very funny and very like characterizing in a way that a lot of narratives aren't um speaking of weatherworks and q tangle on the broomstick they are a great match excuse me um when they are going out in a boat to try and collect the staff there's a lot of back and forth between them of the, you know, back in the good old days kind of thing of, you know, when I was young, there used to be lots of old people, but now everyone's young and I don't like it. And, you know, back in my day, the summers were nice and hot and long and, you know, all of this stuff that if any of you have ever spoken to someone over the age of 30 will know that uh, we are all destined to talk about how back when we were children things were better. In fact, I already do it. Uh, I'm 24 years old and I'm already like, oh, back in my day. Um, but it was, it was, it's a very funny back and forth. And off the back of that as well, people talk about George R. R. Martin being a man who can write really good women, and I am not dissing that. I am not disagreeing. However, Pratchett is the best man writing women, in my humble opinion. Um, and what specifically sort of spawned that on? First of all, all of Pratchett's characters are so human. Whether or not they're human, they're so human they're so people no matter what sort of people they are they're people and that goes for every fantasy race and gender that is shown here ages from children up to very old people everyone feels real and like there's somebody that i could have a conversation with even tiny incidental characters and that's what i find so utterly compelling about pratchett i am a character and plot person um you know, I, I am a character person if a plot isn't all that strong, and really the plot in this isn't all that strong. But the characters are strong, and I love spending time with the characters. And, you know, I can forgive a fair amount of plot issues. A fair amount. You know, like, if the plot's god-awful, you know, it'll ruin it for me. But generally, if the characters are good, I can forgive a lot of other stuff. Um... But one of the greatest things I love about Granny Weatherwax and how he writes about Granny Weatherwax is that she's old, she's got grey hair pulled into a very severe bun, she's got a long hook nose, um, you know, she's very bony and thin and like, although God knows what she actually looks like because she's always wearing like 60 different layers of clothes. Um, because as far as Granny Weatherwax is concerned, she doesn't have a naked body. No, 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 no. Um, and these things being angular and elderly and having a big hook nose these are all presented as completely neutral things you know she's not written about as being ugly she's not written about as being beautiful she's not written about as you know there's no sort of value judgment about what granny weatherwax looks like she is an old lady she is a skinny old lady with bony little elbows and she has a hook nose because some people have hook noses and that's it you know it's, it's completely judgment free and we see this with um you know nanny og as well uh as we get into the series as we get into weird sisters we see this uh there's a standalone review it as a standalone uh and on top of that Q-Tangle got a crush on Granny Weatherwax and it is great because this sort of little crush from Q-Tangle develops. I keep saying Q-Tangle by the way, I don't know if it's Cut-Angle or Q-Tangle, I'm saying Q-Tangle. If that's been driving you bonkers this whole video, I am very, very sorry. Uh, but that's what I think it's pronounced as. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I could have looked it up. 
really, but I'm not going to now because I've been doing this for 40 minutes and I'm not starting again. No, 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 no. So if it is cut angle, not cute angle, or cut angel, or God knows, uh, pfft, sorry. <laughs> anyway, he got a crush and it's based in, you know, liking her as a person and appreciating how powerful she is and that she's got this voice that would raise the dead if she told them to um and all of this and like that she's powerful and to the point and all of these things are really attractive to him and we don't spend a lot of time with cute tangle sort of going on and on and on about like why he finds granny weatherwax attractive or anything but it's just there and i think that's so wonderful because whilst the like narrator doesn't present granny weatherwax as being anything other than these are what her features are you know it doesn't make any value judgments on those features cute angle makes value judgments and those value judgments are yeah i'd have some of that and fair enough you know and like he's not ridiculed in any way for being attracted to this old woman i mean he himself is an old man so obviously but we see so frequently in other pieces of media that anyone who is attracted to any woman specifically who isn't a very specific set of things uh and falls under the conventionally attractive labels are mocked and derided um you know complete tangent here but you know i recently rewatched scrubs because of the event that has kept us all in our houses for last year and oh my god there are so many like horrible jokes about like all oh, that time you had sex with a fat woman it's like mother like <laughs> i just want to strangle people like you know speaking as a fat woman shaped thing You'd be damn lucky to have sex with me, sunshine. Uh, anyway. Uh. Uh, anyway, back to Q-Tangle 282, that's what I was going to say. So, on uh, page 282, um, Q-Tangle is trying to get Granny to take a chair as, um, on, on the like board of the Unseen University and to come in and sometimes do um, lectures and such. And um, he's privy to the ways that witches work. And all the old clothes, you know, you can have all these things for doing it in response to him. Um, and all the old clothes you can carry, he added, using the secret weapon. He had wisely invested in some conversation with Mrs. Whitlow. Mm -hmm said Granny. Silk? Black and red, said Q-Tangle. An image of Granny in black and red silk trotted across his mind and he bit heavily into his scone. Just lovely, you know, just, just nice, because I mean, like, yeah, it's horny, but it's not, like, lecherous. Um, which is it's another thing you see, I guess, a lot of you know, sexual interest in somebody else in fiction being presented as this kind of sort of thing. But it's not, he's just, he's got a crush and he's just accidentally thought about what she'd look like in red and black silk. And that's, that's a nice thought for him, you know? And that's, that's just nice. You know, just celebrating this little, this attraction. I've talked about this for a long time, but it just means a lot to me for reasons I can't quite fully express. But it is just lovely to see you know um and i guess that brings us to the very end so the book ends with this conversation between q tangle and weatherwax and whilst they're having it they're uh ants infected with magic are setting up like trestles and things to steal all of these sugar cubes and Allow me to, allow me to just read it to you. Perhaps more importantly, the ants used all the sugar lumps they could steal to build a small sugar pyramid in one of the hollow walls, in which, with great ceremony, they entombed the mummified body of a dead queen. On the wall of one tiny hidden chamber, they inscribed in insect hieroglyphics the true secret of longevity. 
They got it absolutely right in when it would probably have important implications for the universe if it hadn't, next time the university flooded, been completely washed away. The end. And that's just, you know, completely out of left field. We've not been talking about the ants this entire time, but that we end on this thing of the ants have discovered the secrets to like long life or longevity, and then they're all lost. They're lost in a flood, um, which, you know, irony, I guess. Um, and I wasn't expecting it to end there, really. Um, but it's a nice micro moment for the book to end on as you know cutangle and weatherwax are eating scones and drinking tea and chatting that these ants are busy building pyramids out of sugar that crumble and wash away into nothing uh much like this video has crumbled and washed away into nothing so <laughs> I think that's all I can say about equal rights. This has been a little bit muddled. I will say that I struggled a little bit. I don't know if this has come across, but I struggled a little bit to come up with too much to say about equal rights because ultimately it is fine. It's not brilliant and amazing. I say I've struggled to think of something to say. It's been three quarters of an hour um, that I've been wittering anyway. Hopefully this is a lot shorter when I edit out all of my tangenty waffles but I kind of struggled to say anything because it's fine <laughs> overall like there's not too much of it that really sort of stood out to me as oh I really want to talk about this um because a book that I don't like there are plenty of moments of like I want to talk about this because I'm angry about this and a book that I really like is like I want to talk about this because it's amazing uh, whereas this book is like, I don't know, I have too much to say. Uh, I've managed to say quite a lot, time-wise, but ultimately I didn't have that much important to say. Uh, so we're going to wrap it up here, but please let me know down below your thoughts, feelings and opinions. If I've said anything in this video that you completely disagree with, please let me know because I love to hear your opinions and thoughts. And again, I'm very sorry for how long it has taken for this video to come out. Um, thank you for your patience. I do really appreciate it. And I will be back soon, soon, with the review for Mort because I have got some catching up to do. Uh, <laughs> right, I'll see you next time, guys. Bye bye.